All right. Well, welcome everyone, and um, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Graham. I'm the Events Manager at New Schools Network, and uh, we're really pleased to be uh, joining with I Have a Voice uh, today to bring you this event on the role of schools in encouraging young people um, in, in, into politics. Um, before we introduce the panel, uh, just some housekeeping. Um, please keep your audio muted unless asking a question during the Q&A, um, or you can use the chat box. Um, Please do feel free to keep your camera on uh, throughout the discussion. Um, and just to let you know, this session is being recorded. And now I'm gonna hand over to Rebecca from I Have A Voice, who will be chairing this session. Uh, thank you, Graham. Um, just to let you know, we are expecting Belle um, Ribeiro Addy as well. Hopefully she will um, be joining us soon along with a few other people. But thank you, Graham. It's really great to have an opportunity to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, Whilst I introduce the session, it would be great if everyone could type in the chat where you are in the country and whether you're a teacher, a student or a school leader, just so we can get a feel for who is in the meeting with us. Um, I wanted to give a, a tiny intro to me because I think it's relevant to today's discussion because I didn't have any political education at school and I left school knowing very little about politics and democratic processes. Um, and to be honest, having close to zero interest in it, um, also, I thought um, I'd always cared about issues, but I never joined the dots between what was happening on my doorstep and the things that I cared about and what was happening in politics. Um, and I think that's the case for many young people and adults, actually. Um, but then through a series of fortunate mistakes, I found myself working in the world of lobbying. Um, I've always worked for non-for-profits, so I'd like to think I represent good lobbying and lobbyists, um, of which I believe uh, there are many, um, despite the press that um, lobbying gets. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work on a whole range of issues from climate change to maternal and reproductive health to financial literacy and security. And through this time, I've come to realise that in order to have an impact on the issues that impact our daily lives, whether that be public transport, bin collections, minimum wage, energy bills, exams during COVID, um, you need to understand how politics works and how you can engage with democratic processes to get your voice heard. Um, and the aim of today's session is to have what I hope is an inspiring but also really honest discussion about the role of schools in democratic participation and preparing students to be active citizens. Um, we intentionally invited teachers, school leaders and crucially students as all of these voices are important um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Belle, Alex, Harry and Courtney on the panel. Um, I've got a number of questions to ask our panel, um, but I'd much prefer to ask your questions as you've come along today. Um, so please do use the chat function um, to type your questions and I'll ask as many of them as I can. Um, to get you warmed up, oh brilliant, we've got students from all over. Um, to get you warmed up, we have a couple of polls um, for the audience before we dive into our conversation with the panelists. Um, now, I know that democratic participation is about much more than elections, but voting is a key component of democratic participation. And so last year we surveyed 192 young people about what's stopping them from voting in elections. And so we'd like to know what you think they said was the primary, primary barrier to them voting in elections. And we'd also want to know what's potentially the most significant barrier to you voting in elections. Just give another few seconds for everyone to participate. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Oh, yeah, end the poll now and share results. Um, so hopefully you can all see the results. So actually, the results were reflective of the survey that we ran. Um, so yeah, you're right. The majority of students, it was lack of knowledge as opposed to lack of interest or lack of time. 
um, and interesting that when it comes to what's a significant barrier for you, um, knowledge and time come before lack of interest. Um, for me, this shows that, that for most people, it isn't that there's a lack of interest in politics, it's actually their level of political literacy. And that's why I think it's important that we talk about the role of schools in democratic participation. And a few of you mentioned a lack of time as well. Um, we find it problematic when we're trying to engage with schools around election time that actually elections fall at the same time as exams, um, which, is, which is unhelpful um, to say the least. Um, okay, now that you are warmed up and you're engaging with the session, I'd like to encourage you to use the chat um, to engage with the discussion um, and to raise your questions. But to get things going, I'm going to ask my first question to, Be to Belle Ribeiro Addy. Um, so, Belle was elected as the Labour MP for Streatham in the 2019 general election, making her my MP. Um, she grew up in her constituency on a council estate on Brixton Hill and she attended the independent Streatham and Clapham High School on a scholarship. She went on to graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science with Ethics and Philosophy of Science from the University of Bradford, uh, which is where I'm from. Um, she then completed a Master of Arts in Medical Law and Ethics at Queen Mary University of London and a Graduate Diploma in Law at BPP Law School. Um, before becoming an MP, Bell was Chief of Staff to the Labour Party trailblazer Diane Abbott, and she's also School Governor at St Gabriel's College in Camberwell. Um, so Bell, to kick us off, it'd be really great to just hear about what type of engagement you have with schools in your constituency and the benefits that you think it brings to a school and to students of having a link with their MP. Well, hi everybody and, and thank you for inviting me to speak, I, I really do like the opportunity to go and speak to schools in my constituency, but not just schools. Um, I try and broaden that out to, to youth groups, uh, scout groups as well. What I actually find is that young people probably ask the best questions um, compared to uh, other events that I, that I go to. And um, so a lot of these, because of the pandemic, have been over Zoom, but more recently, a lot of been able to be in person, particularly over the summer, where we were able to use outdoors uh, was able to do it uh, outdoors and I think the it's very interesting that they made a point about the lack of knowledge because a lot of the questions they uh, young people are asking is about how do you get involved how does this work how does that work so it's very clear that the mechanics are, are, are not clear to them and I think it's really really important that everybody does understand that because um, you know they have to be able to use their power as citizens uh, when, when they're older and there are a lot of issues that happen in our society that I think people do want to change um, and they think constantly about how to change it and they don't see politics as a mechanism for that because uh, they don't have enough knowledge about it or not necessarily involved. But a lot of questions I get asked are about my role specifically as an MP, what I do do on a daily basis, what, what, what's happened, what happens in parliament. Um, I do get asked some funny questions about Boris Johnson um, and, and, and and other things that are happening in parliament but it, they also do ask questions about issues. So uh, you know, what's being done to tackle a particular issue. Uh, over the past year, I've received particularly a lot of questions about climate change and what can be done locally about climate change and about uh, youth resources, um, um, about Black Lives Matter when the, when the, when, when the protests were ongoing and, and, and various issues uh, surrounding um, racism um, and, 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 and sexism and safety and things such as that. So the range of questions, um, but all really, really geared to um, what it is that we're doing as, as politicians to support them either in local or national government um, and what it is they can do and, and how it is um, that they become that you one becomes involved in politics or exercises their democratic rights. It's so great to hear that they're able to ask practical questions about how they get involved and also about issues that they care about. That's fantastic. Um, I want to bring Alex in here. Alex is a Conservative Party councillor on Birmingham City Council and he's the Shadow Cabinet Minister for Children's Wellbeing um, and he was the parliamentary candidate for Edgebaston in 2019. Um, he's a strong advocate for the Chinese community, especially on Covid-related hate crime um, and also an advocate for children with special educational needs in Birmingham and on mental health. Um, he established the Sutton Caulfield Youth Council in 2017, which is formed of two student reps from each of the secondary schools and colleges in Sutton to give them a voice in local politics. It'd be great to hear about that. And he's a champion of, of many local causes. 
Um, before getting elected in 2015, Alex graduated from Leicester University with a BA in History and Politics and an MA in International Relations and was self-employed, running a chain of takeaways and has volunteered overseas, um, amongst other things, teaching briefly um, in Ghana and for a year in a secondary school in Shanghai, China. So he has experience of, of teaching like those teachers here today. Um, and he too serves as a, a governor of a local special needs school and his old school. Um, he's also a magistrate and the trustee of the Sutton Coalfield YMCA and the Birmingham um, CBSO. I'm not sure what that stands for. Um, and I'm assuming that he can also function on very little sleep because he's also had two children since we last spoke. <laughs> so congratulations on that, Alex. Thank you, um, thank you Rebecca. <laughs> Alex, it'd be really great to hear about what type of engagement you have with schools in your ward and what the benefits if it's our schools having a link with their local councillors as well as their MPs. Absolutely and uh, um, thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I think absolutely you know it's so important for young people to have a right and they do absolutely have a right to be heard and also to not be a, afraid to express themselves and as you see, see, saw in the poll a lot of this down to education and I think you know elected members um, have a, a duty to make sure that everybody has a you know are able and empowered to share those thoughts, concerns and experiences that they have, um, because everyone has individual lived experience. So individually, we all know what our own journey has been. And the journey of young people is just as important as those who have a right to vote uh, at the moment of those who are involved in the political process. Um, I think also young people, they're the ones who are going to inherit the earth, aren't they? Um, and as you said, a lot of the issues at the moment people are facing, for example, climate change, um, education, uh, mental health, these are issues that perhaps people of uh, my generation above aren't really that fussed about. But, you know, mental health is, of course, very striking um, with secondary schools at the moment. Just talking to Courtney about her experiences um, at secondary school at the moment and decisions are made by those who, who speak up. For myself, you mentioned the Sutton Youth Council. So it is something which um, Alex over in Arthur Terry helped to set up uh, across us and the idea of trying to bring empowerment and a voice to students, two reps from each of the secondary schools, bring them together. And the, the idea is that they get involved, not just in terms of a, a charity event or a local issue that they care about, but also letting them know that there's other ways of getting involved. So as a trustee, you can become a school governor, you can become a magistrate. You can also volunteer as well, which is a fantastic way of getting involved give something back to the community and as you said at the very start this is all about active citizens isn't it it's about making sure that we are involved seen but also having that shared um, experience of what other people are going through as well because it broadens minds it makes sure that you are able to to hear um, other people's views and ultimately to agree to disagree which I think is very important in a healthy democracy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for those practical um, ideas for how to be actively engaged. And, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's important to be able to have those discussions. And we were really keen to have both Conservative and Labour present today um, for that reason, although I'm sure we're all in agreement that democratic participation is important. Um, Alex, I'll, I'll stick with you and come to you with this question first, but when you visit schools and provide talks to young people, how do you avoid being part of political? Because I think that is a concern for a lot of schools. And how do you deal with potentially controversial topics? It's a, a fascinating question. I mean, I don't really see party politics as being a necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think it's how people approach it and what, you know, this kind of the, the stigma that has been covered with. So, you know, everybody who gets into politics or community life or as an active citizen, everybody just wants to improve the local community, wants to see the country do better. So myself, you know, I, we have a certain view or I have a certain view on what I think needs to be done. And, you know, other people have different views. Um, there's no right or wrong with that. And I think it's very important for us all just to understand that, you know, I don't get out of bed thinking, you know, I'm going to destroy the country today or nobody does. Everybody wants to help and improve and to serve. And so many people, uh, my colleagues and people on the Labour side within council, they all just want to do a good job and to help to see what we can do to help improve the, the world and, and uh, our friends and our community. And it's basically as simple as that. Um, on the other hand, it's a whole spectrum and, you know, the, the Tories have got a very bad reputation, unfortunately, sometimes. And, you know, at, at car party conference, I mean, when I'm walking down the street, I had people who had eggs thrown at them, very horrible names called, you know, how many babies have you killed today, you know, shouted across the street. And that's not what we're about. Everybody is here because we want to try and improve the, the world. And in answer to 
when you said about difficult topics, I mean, the, the idea is that, um, I mean, I suppose, you know, cutting it very close to the line, one of the main issues around, um, you know, that people are facing nowadays is, of course, the idea of austerity and spending. And this is a very, very difficult issue to grasp. Um, the idea about how much borrowing we're going through at the moment, how much national debt is at the moment. And of course, you know, generally speaking, the Conservatives are looking at trying to bring that down, hence austerity. The Labour group want to increase spending because, of course, there is a need to make sure that public services are, are served and maintained. So this is a huge issue about you know, what we are grappling with and very, very important issues. And what I'd ask people to consider is that if you're involved in the decision, if you know about what's going on, um, if you are participating in writing letters to your MPs, brilliant. If you don't do that, the issue is still going to be there, but you are going to be powerless and not involved and not informed. So I think it's very important for everybody to read widely, to have a view on both sides, come to an informed decision and then take the hatred out of things, but make sure that ultimately we're all people. You know, I'm, I'm a family man, you know, everybody. And the idea is that when you get attacked on social media, it's like I'm not a human being anymore. But we all are. We all just all people who just want to try and improve our country. Thank you, Alex, for that really um, frank and, and open response. I appreciate it. Um, Bill, I, do you have anything to add to that in terms of how you avoid party politics and handle controversial topics that might arise when speaking with students? Um, I, I actually try and be as honest as possible um, without saying anything that I think is um, potentially too, too, too biased or offensive. If they do ask me my view on a particular subject, I'll give it to them. I might not speak as strongly to them as I do to my colleagues on the opposite side of the house about my views, but I think it's very important to be honest um, with young people more so um, because you have, you have you know, generations who don't trust politicians. So if you, if you start perhaps uh, tempering your views I think they can definitely sniff that out and also I think there's there's a way to put across your views uh, without without being nasty about it and, and, and perhaps slip it, slipping into that um, air of controversy. Yeah absolutely and that's such an important skill for students to have to be able to put their their point across um, articulately um and and not necessarily in a in a combative a combative yeah manner um while she can be robust uh, at the same time um i'd like to bring in harry and then courtney um at this point so harry is a physics teacher and head of secondary projects at school 21 in um and school 21 places a really strong emphasis on oracy and preparing its students to be ready and able to face the challenges of the world and contribute to making their communities a better place to live um harry school 21 has developed a series of approaches that give students the chance to find their voice um, and work on projects that have value beyond the classroom and as part of this you've invited us um, and to work with students to develop their voice in the world of politics. Why do you think it's important to include these broader life skills in your curriculum and how do you manage this against other competing demands? Thanks Rebecca and uh, yeah thanks for having me today. Um, I suppose our school kind of the the focus across the curriculum um, is the idea of empowerment and empowerment is kind of written into our mission statement and I think when we're talking about kind of broader life skills if you think about, I suppose, how politics kind of interacts with our daily lives, um, it's not siloed into a particular subject or a particular place, like a citizenship lesson that went off the curriculum. It's actually broader than that and it touches on everything. So I think whilst we might sort of touch on political issues in the classic subjects uh, that our pupils study, we're also lucky that we have some extra parts of our curriculum that we've built in. Uh, project-based learning being one and for example as project-based learning our teachers can pick something from um, a list of issues to focus their project on but we really try and connect our projects to the real world so rather than our pupils be producing work maybe to sit in a book um, that might not get looked at again they're normally producing some kind of product um, either physical or perhaps kind of a moment in time where they're going to present something to someone from the outside. So whether that was writing a letter to their MP or at the moment we have a group of pupils uh, working with Citizens UK to create a documentary. These kind of experiences hopefully kind of give them something really kind of tangible to attach their learning to. 
Um, so that's one kind of part of our curriculum that kind of gives us space for pupils to kind of live out bits of uh, the real world, but also exposure to some of the stuff that would have been on the citizenship curriculum, but also other kind of issues. It's very kind of issue focused uh, set, uh, list to choose from. Beyond projects, we've got some other kind of things that I think not all secondary schools do. So rather than having kind of a classic tutor time at the beginning of the morning, which maybe lasts for 20 minutes where you can't really get into any depth, we have um, intentional 50 minute sessions instead of tutor time. So lessons start at the beginning of the day, uh, straight away, no tutor time. And then the kids have three sessions a week with their tutor to go into real depth on issues and get into kind of real discussions. And actually something that um, I think Alex said chimed a little bit with our focus there. So there was a bit of a push a while ago for consensus, but actually now we're trying to kind of move towards sometimes consensus is good, but sometimes actually we want to have a shared disagreement and an understood disagreement. So understanding the arguments of the other person, but agreeing to disagree. Um, and as you said, oracy is kind of threaded throughout our curriculum. We think kind of empowering young people, one of the biggest forms of empowerment is for them to be able to express themselves. And that's not something that can necessarily be done in one lesson, but seeing how their voice and their opinions play out in every lesson does really help them form their views. Um, and then we do have our familiar subjects. I think you said kind of how do we make time? At School 21, we, we have uh, eight GCSEs, whereas a lot of schools would do nine, nine's the average. So that builds us a little bit more time into the timetable. And as I said, kind of reducing the tutor time into these bigger blocks means that the, the depth of discussion can be um, a, lot, a lot deeper, I suppose. Um, and I think the main thing is when we look at our school overall, we try and create some additional moments beyond these to get a sense of pupils hearing their voice played out and the democratic process. So one example uh, would be one of our kind of key moments in year nine, where pupils are all asked to deliver a speech. The, the speech is around an issue they see in our school environment that they want to change. And they deliver that speech to their peers. They also deliver it to a panel that would include maybe some governors, a head teacher, some year 12s. And then the best uh, speech and the most kind of compelling argument we try and put into action. So most recently, we've had new school benches, we've had additional water fountains, um, and you know it really feels like the pupils' voice is playing out there. Thank you, Harry. Um, great to hear about how innovative you're being across the school with timetabling, et cetera, to make this possible. We've had a practical question from Alex before we move on, which is, do these issue-based projects take place during the three sessions per week, or do they take place in addition to yeah. those? So in our curriculum, our secondary school sits year nine, 10 and 11. So in year nine, pupils have 200 minutes a week of project lessons, which is separate to their tutor time. Um, and then in year 10, they move from uh, in-school projects to what we call the real world learning placement, where they go out and they do a project with an employer. So for example, we've got a group of kids doing a project with the Met, Met Police, focusing on some issues for them. Um, and trying to give the Met Police an insight of what it's like to be a young, young person in, growing up in Stratford. So it is kind of a ring fence, separate bit of our curriculum. Uh, so it, yeah, it's not taking away from coaching time where they will be talking about issues, but the coaching curriculum also has to cover some, or the tutor curriculum also has to cover uh, PHSE and relationship and sex education as well. Thank you, Harry. That's great. Um, and it's great to hear that they're also linking up with organisations like the Met Police as well. What um, value is this engagement with MPs, local councillors, the Metropolitan Police, etc., bring in to your students, but also your school's community? Um, so I think there's the, the sort of immediate value to students of feeling listened to. Um, and I think, you know, obviously, if it's all well and good having a voice, but you have to have a forum to use it. I think it also allows them to see themselves in different contexts. So if you have a pupil who kind of day in, day out, isn't quite finding the interactions they're having always positive, then actually to put them on a platform and say, well, now's your moment to speak to this professional and you can really get your kind of ideas and thoughts across. It allows them to see themselves in a, in a different context, which they wouldn't necessarily otherwise be able to see. 
Yeah, and that context is, is so important. Thank you, Harry. Um, I'm going to come to Courtney next, as Courtney is a student. Um, Courtney is a student at Arthur Terry School in Sutton Coldfield, um, and she's taken part in one of our programmes. Um, Courtney, it'd be great to just hear from you what you've learned about democratic participation throughout your schooling and what you found to be valuable. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, Mainly, I've learned quite a bit about democratic participation, like features such as direct democracy, representative democracy, the similarities, the disadvantages, the advantages. But the most intriguing thing that I've learned so far is the suffrage and how to expand the franchise. Like, mainly, they've been focusing on the suffragettes and the suffragists. There was like, there's a part of vice placed on society to prevent women from even being considered the vote prior to the revolutionary actions from like so many powerful women. But the difference between the suffragettes and the suffragists was the suffragettes were known for their profound violence and alternative methods. Like a notable woman that is Emily Pankhurst, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what she did. But to juxtapose that, the suffragettes were known for their peaceful methods and like, Early campaigners relied on the peaceful methods that the suffragists did, but then the suffragettes found that wasn't doing anything. So they took necessary action and turned to more extreme, sometimes violent methods. But in this shows the pure power of the public voice and how it's shown to influence the entire world's principles. And that's why I feel like it's really important that me as a person and other people. Uh, Courtney, I think we have lost you. Just give Courtney a moment to see if her connection comes back so that she can finish her fantastic point. Well, Courtney, we lost you just as oh, you no. were telling us. So we heard about your analysis um, of the suffragettes. Yeah. Um, and you were just telling us, therefore, why it's important that you learn about these things. So if you could repeat that last bit, that would be wonderful. Yeah, it shows that the pure power of the public voice and how it strengthens the influence of the entire world's principles. And I feel like it's really important that we do that. Because otherwise, we, won't, we, we wouldn't be able to participate. We wouldn't have any idea. Yeah, it's great to learn about the history of um, democratic participation. How do you um, feel like this relates to kind of your life now and in the future and your likelihood and ability to engage with democracy? Like, I feel like I'd be able to participate in a safe and stable, like, society and a sound economy. Like, I feel like I'd be contributing something. I'd be able to shape society that we live in as everybody does and represent and I'd actually be able to vote and have the knowledge to vote for the party that interests me and have the best interest from my views as a person and it's it's healthy for a democracy but the definition of democracy is that everybody takes part and if people don't have the lack of the education to be able to take part in like votes because they don't they don't know how to they don't know how like what the parties stand for or anything they wouldn't be able to vote and younger people in general we, they can't exactly like, vote on university fees employment leisure facilities and education at most but at the heart of the democracy of theory and practice is that we should young people and me in the future should be able to participate in the political process. The whole point of democracy is that everybody should have the opportunity to learn about the political system. And I feel like with people, like I know you've recently been taken out of the spectrum for people, but I feel like it should be put in back in because most of my friends, they don't, I'll be talking about like, a new bill that's being put into parliament and they'll have not an idea and it's a really important bill yeah brilliant and so you think that all young people should should know about all of these different things mm -hmm. what types of actions have you taken to get involved in in politics and in local democracy and, and what actions would you like to take 
I'm currently, as you know, drafting a letter to Andrew Mitchell about period products in school and to get the tax removed because as it was promised in Brexit that the tax would be removed and there'd be a significantly lower price. But there was a recent there was a recent debate and in the Commons and the Conservative Party recently voted to just keep it the exact same. And they've put in a scheme which is available till June this year. And it states on the website that it's a waste of the taxpayers' money. So I've put drafted a letter to Andrew Mitchell to see what's being done about it and how to stop and shaming period poverty and to get them put into schools to stop people from using all sorts of items to prevent their periods. Such an important topic. Well done, Courtney, on doing that. It's really impressive. And thank you um, for sharing with us what you think everyone should learn um, whilst they're at school and how valuable um, it has been for you. I'm going to um, pause to poll the audience again. Um, Given what you've heard so far today, we'd like to give your school's efforts to promote democratic participation a score from one to five, with five being excellent and one being poor. It's completely anonymous. We just want to know whether you're a student, teacher or not, how you think your school or previous school um, does or is doing in terms of democratic participation. We'd hope that people on this call generally think pretty high, but we shall see. Fantastic. So people generally think middle of the road, actually, we've got a couple of a few twos and a couple of fours, but people generally think middle of the road. It'd be great if people on the chat could, uh, if people could put into the chat what their schools did, that they do well, um, what was missing or what they didn't do well, just so that we can um, learn from one another. It would be great particularly to hear about good things that are happening so those who scored for what it is that you're doing that you think or that you know is really good and helping your students to engage in democracy. Um, I'd also like to encourage everyone to pop their questions in the chat. I've got a few more questions for the panellists but it would be great to have your questions too. Um, Belle, I'm going to come back to you now, if I may. I just want to check you can hear me because on my screen you've frozen, Belle. I can hear you. Sorry, I've been having issues with connectivity all day. It was, uh, I, I haven't frozen in an old position. <laughs> <laughs> no, you hadn't. And I can see and hear you again now. Um, how important was your schooling and your education to your interest in and your ability to engage with politics? And I guess, therefore, what do you think it's important that all students should learn or have the opportunity to, to experience during their time at school to prepare them for a lifetime of democratic engagement? Um, well, I would say in primary school and secondary school, um, I wasn't taught as, as much and a lot of what I learned was from getting involved in different things at university and I think that was, was an issue. I think children should at least leave secondary school with a good understanding because by, they by the time they leave in Scotland certainly they can vote by the time they're 16 and in, 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 in England and Wales by the time they're 18 and I hope that does drop to 16. But when it does there has to be better um, civic civic engagement, civic understanding um, how things how things work. For example, there have been various changes in voter registration um, over the past, uh, well, there's definitely one going through now, um, but there have been changes over the past few, few years or over a decade at least, where there were places way back in the day where you would automatically be registered, for example, if you're in council housing or if you're in student accommodation these sorts of things have changed. And a lot of people don't realize until it comes to the day of the election that perhaps they may not be registered to vote. And that makes a difference as to whether or not they can participate. So going, so going straight from there. But I think if I had if I'd known more um, at a young age, perhaps I could have been more engaged. Perhaps um, if my cohort had known more, uh, you might see even younger people involved in, in, in politics. Um, obviously I, I, 
I was going to say I like all of my colleagues. Yes, I like all of my colleagues. Um, but, you know, at the moment, there is there is an age range in Parliament which isn't necessarily reflective of the population um, and isn't necessary. And, and some MPs have been MPs for a very, very long time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're not seeing, I suppose, change come through in the way that we would like to because... Um, I, I don't think views of the views of young people are getting crossed. They're less less likely to vote, or they're less expected to vote. And what you find, unfortunately, um, is that demographics that vote the least uh, are, are, are paid the least attention to. I think it, it's definitely reflected in policy. Uh, so I think young people and other underrepresented groups can change their lot um, if they use their democratic power. And that's why we need to understand it from as young as possible. Thank you, Pam. Um, Harry and Alex. Um, not Alex Yip, Alex Zarifa. Um, you're both teachers. Um, do you do voter registration and things around elections at your schools? Um, Harry, if I come to you first, just picking up on what Bell said then about young people engaging in different demographics. Um, I've got to say, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think I've taught a year group necessarily at that moment when it might have happened. Uh, so maybe if I pass that one over to Alex. Yeah, because you've actually got years nine to eleven, haven't you? So that one, yeah, maybe some support. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody, um, and thanks for inviting me to be part of the very interesting conversation, which I hope um, you know ripples at, out wider and wider and takes it back to where it once was, which was top of the new Labour agenda, and it was a big deal in citizenship education, where political education when it was done well, and it took 10 years to be done well, to be fully embedded in the schools across the country, um, and it required an Ofsted programme, these kind of changes to get uh, political literacy up in terms of, apart from individual brilliant examples like Harry, who's sort of maintained that, or developed that, and as a whole school kind of drive has embedded that in their whole curriculum, mapping which is to be commended and brilliant but to really have impact it has to be a national drive has to be checked on by Ofsted because that's the only thing that really gets schools moving and we threw it all away Michael Gove came in and I'm sorry to say due to the academization process we've lost a generation we were getting to the point I was teaching in a very poor state school where white working class communities the number one underperforming demographic in the country uh, were engaging in politics in very meaningful ways. I mean, do you remember, the, do you remember there used to be problems in Darfur? We had the poorest white community in Birmingham, in Birmingham and a weekend doing um, camps and setting up makeshift refugee camps. This is what, 15 years ago or something. Amazing things were happening, like Harry was saying, connecting with all kinds of public services, you know, uh, big, big projects. And that was the the biggest loss we've lo uh, we've we so suffered as a country to having young people from the state sector. I was lucky enough to go to a private school where you had debating societies and political societies and clubs. And we had, I remember Trevor McDonald one day coming to talk to us about his experience of the Caribbean and, and the media and all this. You get that in those schools, but they don't have that in the, Speakers for Schools, by the way, is a great program. They don't offer that. I mean, Courtney's brilliant. My student, I can't believe how articulate Courtney, I mean, you're obviously brilliant in our lessons, but you did so well speaking in front of adult peers and just amazing to congratulate you. But um, the ordinary state school child doesn't get that. I mean, in our school, yes, Courtney is fully up to speed because she's chosen out of her interest to, to want to know about politics. But, you know, the odd assembly, yeah, sure, we do mock a... We do mock elections, we do it quite well. We've even set up in the past um, proper voting booths. We had them made, so they had secret, they had uh, privacy booths, just as you would. We had people uh, sat there where they cross off your address to make sure with the, with the old uh, system of verification, simply doing that. We gave them a real experience. We had preceding weeks of building up with different students. So I helped train to be able to talk through the manifesto summaries. Great, and we got covered by TV news and this and that, but so what? It's a one-off island of success. And what you need is it to be a national statutory delivery. And I believe, I'm afraid to say, we were talking earlier, Alex, about 
the need for ecumenical cross dialogue, but I believe it was a deliberate and cynical ploy because they didn't like ordinary people truly becoming active citizens and being aware of the political process. Now that's quite a skeptical view, but I was leading, I was involved in, in the House of Commons. Uh, I remember having tea in the House of Commons members room trying to, with um, various stakeholders, trying to prevent it, us losing it as a country, but I'm afraid I didn't have the power to uh, our organization, have the power to stop that. And it's just a, such a shame because Alex Yip's doing great things in Sutton, using students to then reach out to other students. Harry's school knew him doing great things. Our school, you know, doing some nice things. But I'm sad, sad to say, until we get back to a, a case where it's delivered uniformly, we're never going to get back to where we once were. And, and it's tragic, really, because we really were getting somewhere. So brilliant to everyone's individual islands, but I think we need a, a national approach. Um. Thank you, Alex. I will come to um, Alex Yip now and, and give you a chance to, to respond to that. And just also, it'd be great to hear your views on how important schools and students' voices are in local democracy. And you've set up something amazing in Sutton Coalfield to get more schools and young people involved in local democracy. Is there a way for us to make these types of initiatives national? Um, and get young people from all walks of life, all walks of life, more involved in politics. Yeah, and I, th I think Alex has, has articulated very powerfully, you know, the knock-on effects of of national policy changes, and Courtney equally on the other side of the spectrum about the opportunities available if people stand up and make real change and get involved. Um, I was just thinking about Bell's. Um, own contribution in, in terms, you know, your, your background and, you know, for myself being um, Hong Kong Chinese origin, I mean, we will see about the repression that's happening over there. Um, you mentioned when I was teaching over in China, I actually did a trip over to Umji, which is over in this, the uh, Uyghur province. Um, I did a trip down to Tibet. So we see, you know, the huge repression that's going on over there with people who don't have the right to vote. Um, and yet in the UK, we have voter turnouts and general elections around 65%, local elections around 40%. And in my casework, there's so many residents who contact me not knowing what a local councillor does, not knowing what an MP does, um, asking me for, you know, for, for foreign affairs advice when, you know, I, I, I look at bins and, and trees and things. Um, not just as simple as that, but, you know, there is, there is, of course, hierarchical structures. And it goes a lot to what Alex says around um, an, a sort of a national process of where actually everybody knows what their democratic rights are, how to get involved, making sure that, you know, you are an active, participative uh, member of society. And it goes back to what I said at the very start around, I believe everybody has a, a right and responsibility to make sure everybody has that voice so that we do have a, a healthy and vibrant democracy. Otherwise, I think we're all the, the lesser for it. And Alex just says there is very good local work done in islands and unfortunately is islands at the moment because we don't have that joined up uh, approach but I think it's, it's really important to start wherever we can and for us each individually to be the difference that we want to see. Thank you Alex and um, we've had a question in the chat about whether you think the government's doing enough to increase democratic participation amongst young people in reference to the voter ID concept. We're here today to talk about the roles of schools in democratic participation so I wonder if I could slightly change the emphasis of that question and be how can schools and the government whether that be at a local level through councillors or whether that be at a parliamentary level through their MPs um, work together to get young people more engaged in politics and that's an, an open question to the panel um, if anyone would like to come in on this question. If I can quickly jump in, so I think the heart of the question originally in terms of voter ID, so I mean, yeah, I, I believe that, you know, you should have uh, some form of an ID to come and vote. You've got to, you need to take a passport or a letter or something if you go to, to Royal Mail to collect a passport. So I don't really think there's a huge issue around that. What I did have an issue with was when they um, 
did it in terms of online um, registration, you need to take a national insurance number, etc. And that did turn a lot of people from ethnic minority communities off. So there are changes which are quite controversial. And again, it goes back to the idea around making sure that everybody is involved in changes. If we had a strong British Chinese uh, representation on that, perhaps we could have made those changes and, you know, taking it further, even in the census, the national census. So they took out the British Chinese box, which, you know, I was particularly quite annoyed with. So there's things like this, which, you know, in terms of democratic participation and visibility, there are things which, you know, we really do need to, to, to take forward. Um, what I would suggest is, you know, it's promotion of photo ID, um, sorry, voter registration. There are huge benefits in terms of your credit uh, rating, for example, and it's one thing that you only have to do once and it stays with you for, for some time. Um, and again, it's the, the, the advantages of if you know that you are voting and it's one action that you do every four years or perhaps more frequently if there's by-elections, perhaps another generally in a couple of weeks time, then, you know, people actually see it, it is an important thing and a democratic right to be to be seen and involved. Thank you, Alex. Um, Elle, Harry or Courtney, would you like to come in on this question? Um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the current uh, voter ID law, which I think is going to restrict um, some people and, 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 and cause some problems. So I hope to see uh, some changes in that as it makes its way through uh, Parliament. Always have to remain hopeful um, as, a, as a backbench Labour MP. Uh, but, but I think restricting people's participation in that way is not going to in increase in volume. We're already struggling. Um, and I, 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 I think we could definitely go further in terms of resources. A lot of things have, have to do with resources and, and quite frankly, not a lot of resources have been put behind making sure people understand um, our, our, our democracy, um, how they can make sure they're engaged in voting and, and what, what, what their individual representatives um, can do from them. Loads of things are offered. So for example, at the House of Commons, um, any school can contact the House of Commons and you know, be given a tour um, once we reopen again, uh, but there are a lot of virtual um, resources there as well to help people understand uh, Parliament and 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 lecture and and um, lesson plans and lecture plans for understanding and things like. That. And, th and those are great, but does every school necessarily have the ability to access them? Um, and, and and what's being done to educate people further? So I think a lot more resource needs to be put into it. There needs to be a, a proper plan, um, as opposed to saying it'd be really nice if people took the time to understand more about their but more about their democracy, that's that's not going to change anything. Yeah, thank you, Belle. Um, and Harry and Courtney, just an invite if you did want to come in on that question. I might just add, add kind of one thing, I think sort of that final step has been spoken about a little bit about actually kind of getting people to vote, but I think it does, it does start younger. And um, certainly anecdotally, we see some kids put off at the sight and the sound of politics. Uh, it doesn't always sound like an inviting thing but actually, if you strip it back from some of the, the kind of terms and words and actually talk about the issues first, um, then generally they're hooked. And I think that's really kind of when we're thinking about our kind of curriculum design and things, starting kind of young with the, the issues that matter to them in, in, their, in their really small everyday world, whether that's the food in the canteen or what they perceive to be unfair in the classroom and letting them be passionate about those issues and then scaffolding that journey towards actually seeing that issues that they see on their way home are related to politics. So that by the time there's a bit of a hurdle to jump to get registered, then they are ready to jump the hurdle because they see that it's something that's connected to the things they believe in. Yeah, I think that, that's so important to talk about, I guess, the broader skill sets and just that passion and interest in issues in your community that then you join the dots between that and the world of politics at a point at which you can engage um, with that world in a meaningful way through voting, albeit obviously you can engage with it beforehand, whether that's through volunteering um, or um, through contacting your MPs and your local councillors. Um, Courtney, how important has kind of the politics on offer at your school been to you feeling like you have the skills and the knowledge to engage in politics, not just to vote in elections, but more broadly? And do you think if you didn't have such great provision at school, like, are there alternatives or is school really a key vehicle for you to gain the, those skills? I feel like school is quite fundamental because 
if I didn't have the education which I have now which I'm very lucky for and to be able to have politics as an A level I feel like I'd take on my parents my parents views or take on anything from social media I feel like I'd be easily influenced on there and as we know social media is full of misinformation so I feel like school as a general would be very important to learn about it like I have friends and I'll try and have like a debate about them about some like a recent election that's happened or like a bill that's came in and some of them will have an idea what's going on and have quite opinionated views and then some of them will be like I have no idea what you've just said (laughs) and it's I don't feel like everybody's got the same interest in it as everybody else does because they'll try and get involved but then there's nothing to get involved with and when you say there's nothing to get involved with what what do you mean by that I didn't like certain opportunities like my friends who haven't took politics as an a level they'll have they'll try and express their views but they have nowhere to express their views from yeah I understand thank you and such an important point that you raise around social media and misinformation in this world that we live in I feel like that's a whole like new game in politics now of trying to manage um kind of social media and engagement Harry is that something that you discuss with your students at school kind of that interaction uh kind of the role of social media and potential for misinformation yeah, it's um, especially as a science teacher, uh, it feels like something that's always on our mind. Um, actually, it was only this week we were having quite a detailed um, sort of science meeting about kind of the role of the media and kind of thinking about how to deal with misinformation. Uh, it's also something we've tackled in projects. So we, we had um, a researcher come in from the Institute of Physics to deliver a project on science in the media in particular. And we've done some other kind of media related projects to try and increase their kind of literacy around it and kind of that whilst those things were of choice in our coaching curriculum we do we do kind of look at uh, social media quite heavily and the impact on kids lives uh, particularly through the lens of kind of mental health and well-being but also misinformation as well yeah brilliant thank you um and Alex and Belle, is this something that comes up in conversation with the young people that you you meet with? Um, kind of, do they have the wrong impression of certain issues based on their interactions in social media, and you find you have to do a lot of correcting, or have you had experiences on social media that suggests there needs to be more um, teaching around what information is available on there, and and I guess just general conduct on social media as well. Absolutely. Unfortunately, because social media is so is so fast, once a story is out there, um, then that's what people believe it is. And, and people don't check back to read, uh, for example, where it's because, you know, everything's moving so fast. It's not the issue of the day anymore. Someone prints a retraction of something. Uh, no, but no one really cares. So it's, it's really difficult to to get to the bottom and to get and, and to get and, and to get to truth. Unfortunately, when there's so much noise. And there's so many different mediums. And I think that's why more recently social media companies had had a lot of pressure on them to deal with issues of fake news. Um, you may have seen them do things like take down Trump's tweets and things like and any any tweets that, uh, for example, um, give misinformation about COVID. So, that, so they've had to do that. They've had to take on that responsibility. But unfortunately, um, with all the different platforms, it's so vast. It's really difficult to grasp. Um, what's happened so, yeah, on a number of occasions I'll be asked seemingly uh, r- r- ridiculous almost but it's what they heard on social media and it was trending for a long time so 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 it then becomes a fact yeah gosh yeah thank you Bell. um Alex did you want to come in yeah please there's, there's a fantastic point around it it's a, it's a self perpetuating cycle isn't it because we're the ones who are clicking on the on the links we're the ones who are reading and it feeds the machine if nobody reads it you know it will very quickly dissipate um and also there, there's a, a wider poisonous sort of atmosphere that's being created by ourselves and other people so i remember um, an interview of a very senior um politician who was asked 
20 different questions and they gave the same strap line 20 times. And that's because there's a, a fear, and I'm sure Bell would, would agree with me on this sometimes, is that if you're in an interview, interviewers sometimes will try and catch you off guard, they try and get you to mislead you to take it down a, a wrong way. And out of a 10 minute interview, they will take that one sentence that you said and misconstrue it. So naturally, politicians are on the defensive because you know we're also very, very worried about if something is printed once, it's out there forever. So there is a, a, a need for, I think, everybody just to be really mindful of the consequences of their own actions and also that personal responsibility. So, um, you know, when you're reading through a, a, a release, a press release, think about the other side. If you're reading comments, just think, you know, and question where that's coming from or where that individual motivation for that comment. I mean, I for myself, is I subscribe to The Guardian because I like to read the other side to see and to, to point check my own views and comments to see if I can hold my view to what's being said, then at least... And I'd, I'd encourage everybody just, you know, keep an open mind. You know, the, the idea of agreeing to disagree is so fundamental to everything that we do. And it's just utterly lost at the moment. It's quite sad. Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you, everyone, for your um, contributions today. It certainly seems from what we've said that there are many wide benefits to teaching young people about democratic participation. Um, not only for their, them to become active citizens, but actually the skills that you gain as part of that, our, our lifelong skills and, and much broader um, beyond kind of voting in elections and, and politics per se. Um, I just wanted to ask a favour of everyone on the call before you leave on behalf of a group of students that we're working with who want to gather their peers' views on what they want to know about politics to inform the all-party parliamentary um, group for political literacy's work. Um, and so they'd be extremely grateful if anyone would have time to fill in this survey and share it with other students that they're working with. They want to hear from students who engage with politics, but also students who aren't, so that we don't get a completely um, biased sample. Um, just for the teachers listening to let you know, we also put posts on Instagram each week with a summary of what's going on in Parliament, and then we run interactive polls and things like that. If you want to use them as a starter for discussion in your classrooms, they're just there on a weekly basis for you to use. And there we try our best to not be biased um, and just put information across and, and some additional context. Um, yeah, so all this, it leaves me to say is thank you so much to Belle, to Alex, to Courtney and to Harry for taking part in our conversation tonight and, and giving us such thoughtful responses to the questions that we've put to you. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, we really appreciate it. I hope that you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>